Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. There has been a lot of criticism against the United States' approach towards the Middle East since U.S. President Barack Obama took office and changed the world's leading powers' foreign policy, bringing back chaos to an already challenging region. To discuss the United States' regional involvement and the implication it has on the Middle East, are with me in the studio Steve Lindsay, uh, Lindy, Editor-in-Chief of the Jerusalem Post Daily. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren. Thank you. Amir, the United States has a strong effect on the region. It always has uh, since it really took the forefront in leading the, the international community uh, defined as the, the world power, the Rome of the 21st century. Since Obama took office, things started to change. There's been already talk for a longer time by the Democratic Party in the United States of the use of smart power, which is more soft power, trying to use diplomacy and, and other aspects into this uh, uh, broil of, of chaos, uh, which is called the Middle East. How are things really going on right now with the United States on that matter? Why don't you tell the Islamic State about uh, smart power or soft power? They apparently haven't mm. heard of uh, it. Uh, they uh, try to uh, go about it the old way. Now, there is an eternal uh, debate uh, about continuity and change in American foreign policy. And even during the last seven years of the Obama regime, you might ask yourself uh, how much uh, continuity uh, versus how much uh, change. These were indeed tumultuous years whether Obama caused the upheaval here or was only there when it started, the Arab Spring uh, and so on and so forth, we can go on uh, about it. But his uh, uh, expressed aim to pivot to the Far East has gone to naught mm -hmm. because the Middle East is still the most important, the key region in the world, and the United States is going to have to deal with it uh, even when the next uh, occupant gets into the White House January 20th, 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Lindy, when we're talking about the United States, key allies of the United States in the region, whether it's Israel, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's uh, other regional players who have had a key uh, decision-making within the constellation of the region, have felt as if they've been abandoned by the United States. Uh, if you look at uh recent months where Saudi Arabia has taken a very aggressive approach uh trying to uh voice their own desire to to maintain their power on the one hand and on the other hand to really uh set in their strategic goals before the American strategic goals that they have had for so many years then we have also Egypt which has you know, when Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the uh, president, came out and said, we're not going to put eggs just in one basket, we're going to try and spread them around. And you see an active policy of trying to find more players within the constellation of, um, of allies, uh, which the United States have been a key factor for Egypt in past years, and Israel as well. You see now a look towards the east, which Netanyahu has spoken about a few times, you see also a look towards Russia, uh, the coordinated mechanism set in place with President Putin about regional affairs. What is going on here? Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure that I have the answer. I think that um, clearly from the Obama administration's point of view, Iran has been the central issue in its foreign policy agenda. And, and making that historic deal with Iran last year uh, was key. But in doing so, I think uh, the United States, uh, if not alienated, certainly angered uh, both Israel and Saudi Arabia and to some degree uh, the Gulf states as well, um, all of whom vocally or not so much opposed the Iran deal. Um, for all kinds of reasons, Iran being a major sponsor of terrorism in the Middle East, etc., uh, and also uh, a sponsor of proxies such as Hamas in uh, Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon. But I think uh, if you're asking about the general big picture, um, uh, yes, um, the, the Middle East is in, in a chaotic state, and we're seeing all kinds of forces at work here. I think Amir would agree. Uh, we see... A, 
battle between Shia and and uh, Sunni on the one hand. We see a battle for hegemony between uh, Iran and maybe Saudi Arabia or Egypt, uh, depending on how you look at things. Um, from Israel's point of view, I think um, this has been a, a learning curve. Suddenly there's daylight in our relationship with our biggest ally, Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was created purposely by the Obama administration um, for all kinds of reasons. Like you said, it was a, a pitch to the uh, Muslim world, his Cairo speech, um, and also because I think Obama wants his legacy to be this Iran deal. Of course, if you ask Prime Minister Netanyahu what he wants his legacy to be, I think it would be also to stop Iran from becoming nuclear. Uh, and I, so I think both, both countries have the same strategic interest. It's just how we get there mm -hmm. is a matter of dispute. Mr. Olin, uh, Mr. Lindy just spoke about the Cairo speech, which was a key speech in Obama's uh, uh, start uh, within the constellation of the regional policy, which he has been pursuing uh, for quite some time. Uh, when Obama came here, he actually looked at the Muslim Brotherhood and put on them a lot of his weight, a lot of his chips were put on uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which fairly so were really on the rise. Uh, you could see also Turkey on the one hand, which is a strong supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood with uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan having great relations with the United States at the beginning of the uh, Obama administration. Also, we see other organizations within the region and a lot of uh, organizations which were defined by the international community as internationally recognized terrorist organizations were suddenly within grabs of being, uh, or the West was able to control them to a certain extent. Everything just evaporated in one instant when uh, the uh, presidency of uh, Muhammad Mulsi at the time was ousted. How does this play out right now when we're looking really on this brief history, which actually just evaporated in an instant? Well, Barack Hussein Obama uh, is obviously the first minority president that the United States uh, ever had. And when his picture joins those on the wall, uh, it will be uh, evident. Um, he probably had some more foreign travel uh, than uh, your uh, typical American teenager growing up. He grew up in Hawaii and in Indonesia, and he uh, visited his uh, father's relatives in Kenya, and he traveled as a young man in Europe. But uh, his uh, foreign policy outlook emanated from his um, personal experience as um, one who grew up uh, in uh, Indonesia uh, in a, a Muslim uh, household. Uh, whose father, the uh, Kenyan uh, Obama, was a Muslim and who worked as a community activist uh, organizer in Chicago and looked to the um, civil rights movement of the 60s as a guideline. And he took his foreign policy tenets from this experience, trying, for uh, uh, instance, to extrapolate from the south of the 1960s in the United States to the Middle East, be it to the Palestinians or to Muslims or to Arabs in general who are not living in a democracy. And therefore, the Muslim Brotherhood seemed to him like a democratic expression of the will of, for instance, the Egyptian people, Egypt being the most important Arab country. And naively enough, he expressed that both in Cairo and when he went to Turkey on the same first trip abroad, looking for Muslims to express themselves more freely than they had under Mubarak, uh, for instance. Now, of course, it all came apart because the Muslim Brotherhood did not intend to get to power democratically and keep democracy alive by then uh, transitioning to the next uh, guy who wins uh, the elections. And the Egyptian people rejected the Brotherhood, even before the coup, which brought Sisi to power. So um, Obama, who uh, uh, obviously has presided over the decline of American power here, uh, all the while there is the Russian 
rise in power. Obama has um, uh, expressed himself in a new slogan, leading from behind. This is not good enough for the Middle East. Mm. Uh, not good enough indeed, Mr. Lindy, when we're talking about uh, the current American approach. Uh, we're uh, not putting boots anymore on the ground, using resources and aerial superiority in order to implement certain policies. Uh, we can see this active role in the U.S.-led coalition, whether it is in Syria, Iraq, and those countries. But something is not working here. We have currently over a quarter of a million people already slaughtered and killed in Israel's northern neighbor, Syria. How is this playing out? Well, um, I, I, clearly, it's, this, is not, this is not good. And uh, I, I think that um, not just the genocide in Syria itself, but also the mass exodus of refugees uh, from Syria all over, uh, including into Europe, uh, is, is not a healthy development. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's look at the root cause of it. And I think uh, we have obviously, um, firstly, a dictator in Syria named uh, Hafez al-Assad and, uh, sorry, Bashar, 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 Bashar al-Assad, no. his son. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, he has been in power, at least the way I see it, way too long, uh, perhaps propped up by, you know, the Russian government or uh, all kinds of other interests. I think that um, the U.S. administration should have worked much more actively. Um, clearly, this isn't his, Israel's battle, but uh, the international community should have worked to oust him from power. Um, the fact that he's been allowed to uh, slaughter his people, as you put it, for so long is, I think, uh, is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the emergence of uh, the Islamic State uh, movement as well, which is even worse, mm -hmm. uh, if you like. So, um, And all this out of a result of American policy. Well, I wouldn't blame only American policy here. I think uh, there are all kinds of uh, people and experts, Amir, I think you'd agree with me, uh, who, d who didn't foresee this. There, mm -hmm. some, some did, but um, I, I, I think the Americans have played their cards wrong. Don't get... Don't misunderstand me, but I don't think uh, the Russians have played a very positive role in this. Um, I, I think the, the rest of the international community, and by the way, the Arab world, mm. uh, have not played a positive role. For example, um, the Arab world itself should have been uh, taking in refugees mm -hmm. from Syria, and yet they turned their backs to a large degree. Um, Israel um, has played a very silent role for the most part. Um, Israel has helped uh, Syrians uh, wounded in the civil war, uh, has hospitalized and treated as many as it could. Uh, it has intervened uh, militarily where necessary against Hezbollah or, you know, uh, thwarting attacks against Israel. Um, but it, this is not Israel's war. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, if you remember um, under President Clinton, uh, a lot of people forget that the Rwanda genocide happened under his watch. And um, I don't know how history will remember President Obama, but this Syrian genocide happened under his watch. And I think uh, carrying out airstrikes against ISIS uh, is not the way to destroy ISIS. I think uh, in a way you can learn from the Israeli example with Hamas, uh, the more Israel in the beginning, Israel actually encouraged the emergence of Hamas, but the more Israel tried to cut the arms of Hamas, so it grew new arms like, you know, that Greek mythological character, mm -hmm. Cyclops maybe. Uh, so this is not the way to, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to uh, destroy ISIS. Um, so I, I don't agree with uh, the coalition's policy against Islamic State. I think. Uh, it talks the talk, but it's not walking the walk. And from Israel's point of view, at least, we want to hear American leaders not only say the right thing, but do the right thing. Well, actually, this is a very strong point. Uh, Owen, when we're talking about American involvement or actually non-involvement. Uh, there is a very strong power vacuum. We heard Mr. Lindy talking about uh, Russian involvement in Syria things that have been actually not really within the constellation of uh, a, a key factor 
in any conflict in the region suddenly has taken a role and a leading role in a conflict which is actually uh, affecting the entire Western community and the international community with the largest refugee crisis since World War II. So uh, this is on the one hand, and we have Israel uh, with uh, actually doubts about American uh, involvement in certain things, how much it actually keeps Israel within its strategic thinking, and some worries have been arose uh, by uh, key factors of the defense establishment and Saudi Arabia. You can see also this aggressive approach by various uh, key factors who have been uh, regional dominating forces. Suddenly, a lot of uh, changing in the power balance, which we talked about last week. Uh, what is going on there? Well, uh, several points here. Let's um, tick them off, uh, not necessarily in that order. Israel has nowhere else to go. You mentioned uh, looking east, um, perhaps to China or India, but uh, it's not viable. Israel gets uh, approximately $3 billion a year in defense assistance from the United States, and this is one facet of American involvement in the region which uh, shouldn't be ignored. When we say the Americans uh, are not as involved as they used to be, Remember that this is a fact, much as uh, Israel's um, being a strategic asset is, is a fact. Now, when you talk about the country, it seems as if we understand what we are talking about. But countries here in the Middle East are composed of communities, of tribes. They are multi-confessional. Is Lebanon really a country? Is Iraq really a country? Is Syria under a minority Alawite uh, dictator, a country. And therefore, when they fall apart, this would be the natural um, order, um, unless you have a dictator, and dictators in this region do not lead. They are the lead. They are the lead on the simmering pot. And when you take this lead off the pot, as the Americans did with Saddam Hussein uh, 13 years ago, or as the civil war, the, the uncivil war in Syria has been doing for the last almost five years now, then you have uh, uh, this sort of uh, mayhem. Now, uh, the American experience is that they are not able to commit themselves for a very long time in this region. There just is no domestic support for that. And therefore, if you are not able, enable. This is what they are now saying. We will be the enablers. Enabling means giving intelligence, logistics, training, weapons, money, uh, coordination, anything short of boots on the ground. Now, Defense Secretary uh, Ash Carter has been in the region and as well as in Europe over the last couple of weeks, and he has uh, expressed a three-stage policy. First of all, get at what he calls the parent humor, the parent humor of ISIS in Iraq and in Syria. Obviously, the Americans are doing double the amount in Iraq as they do in Syria. In Syria, the Russians take the lead. Then attack ISIS in other places like Libya or Yemen, wherever they get out of their parent humor. And the third one is protect the homeland, the, the United States. Now, this is a long, drawn-out process unless they are able to get the two centers of gravity of ISIS, Mosul in Iraq and Raqqa in Syria. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lindy, how are we looking in Israel within this constellation? Well, I think uh, Israel's feeling very left out and isolated. Um, I think um, the lack of engagement by the United States in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has also taken its toll. And um, I'm not blaming that, but uh, it's certainly one of the reasons for the upsurge in terrorism against Israelis in the, in the last several months, uh, which, you know, no one really knows, is, is it getting better or worse? What is the security situation here? What is behind these so-called lone wolf attacks? And will it become more organized? We've seen to some degree, um, you know, it's moved a little bit now with the uh, uh, murder of a woman in her home in, in the settlement of Otniel this week. Um, it could be shifting and it could be escalating. Mm -hmm. um, I think that from Israel's point of view, 
It wants to see support from its most important friend in the world, the United States. But I think from the Palestinian point of view, and I, I'm not a Palestinian spokesman as well, the Palestinians also feel left out in the cold when it comes to, well, why has the United States disengaged so uh, obviously mm -hmm. um, from, from the peace process and not urged the sides in any way and exerted any pressure on them to come back to the table? And also, how come we have a leader of the opposition in Israel Isaac Herzog saying so publicly that he himself doesn't see uh, any chance of a two-state solution mm. in these circumstances. Mm. That certainly can't be good either for Israel or the Palestinians or the Middle East in general. This may not be the core of the Middle East conflict, but you cannot ignore it. And at some point, as Amir Oren said, you're going to have to address it. Mm. Um, I think the longer you leave it, the worse it is. Uh, it's been left certainly long enough if you, if you want to, it depends where your starting point is, but right. if, you, if 67 is your starting point, it's been left way too long. And the, the longer you leave it now, the more the settlements will become a fait accompli and the more difficult it will be to have any kind of a solution. Mr. Owen? Um, I, I uh, obviously agree with Steve, uh, but the chances for an outside intervention by great powers is less now than it was before this uh, regional uh, chaos uh, overtook all of them and demanded uh, uh, so many assets uh, from them and uh, so much attention. If uh, 20 years ago or so, Israel and Syria uh, could have reached an agreement regarding the return of the Golan Heights under certain conditions in return uh, for peace and uh, the uh, imposition of some uh, UN uh, brigade on the Golan Heights to uh, demilitarize or to serve as a buffer, right now it's uh, almost uh, impossible to, to think about it because of all the commitments and because there will be so many other organizations uh, which are not going um, uh, to obey uh, mm -hmm. to whatever any uh, Syrian government, if we ever are going to see a Syrian government back in Damascus uh, holding uh, sway over the entire country. So um, the, the um, American-led multinational uh, uh, force and observers in the Sinai is always on the brink of being evacuated. First, because uh, it was not needed. And now, because it is under pressure by Daesh or Wilayat uh, Sinai. Uh, uh, so uh, this, this particular wish by Israel and the Palestinians, perhaps even more so by the Palestinians, for some internalization of the conflict uh, uh, has a slim chance. However, uh, within this crisis, there is also an opportunity, for instance, um, for better ties between Israel and Saudi Arabia, mm. who seem to be on the same mm. page regarding Iran, uh, for instance. But this calls for creative uh, leadership and uh, some uh, forward-seeing uh, policy. This actually brings me to a, a very uh, specific question here. Uh, Mr. Lindy, you spoke also before about the nuclear agreement with Iran, the implementation of the uh, nuclear agreement, which has actually lifted the sanctions on the Islamic Republic and brought about a new Iranian policy, a new Iranian involvement, if you will, within the constellation of the region. It's a lot more active. It has also a lot more resources in order to seek certain aspirations to really develop its uh, military capabilities and strengthen its uh, position within the proxy war of the region. Its rival, Saudi Arabia, as uh, Mr. Owen stated, has also brought Saudi Arabia and Israel closer together. But we see a lot of images, a lot of uh, press conferences, a lot of situations where the United States is pretty much playing best friends with Iran at the time when its allies are terrified from Iran, right. where Defense Minister Moshe Yalom from Israel announces that Iran and the Islamic Republic is still the arch enemy of Israel. Saudi Arabia also voicing many concerns, uh, severing ties with it. Where does the United States actually stand here? Well, again, I'm not speaking for the United States, but um, it seems to me that, as Amir Oren said, new alliances are being formed, and maybe that is a, a positive uh, development. Um, in terms of uh, why the United States has decided to bring in Iran as sort of a member of uh, the civilized nations and whether that'll work, 
again, only history will tell. But it, it doesn't seem that um, the Iranian ballistic missile test and uh, various other violations of the deal, as well as an Iranian cartoon contest on Holocaust denial, or an Iranian, I saw a comic strip uh, thing on the internet where they are bombing Saudi Arabia. I mean, these things should be taken seriously. Iran is, and now that it has all this money, I think it's a very dangerous situation. I think in the wake of, in the face of that dangerous situation, these new alliances between Israel and moderate Arab states, uh, as you say, perhaps Saudi Arabia, uh, could all come together, perhaps in some kind of new international Middle East conference to discuss uh, ways to confront the new Middle East. But um, I certainly uh, think that the time has come to um, uh, f f for a new effort. Uh, again, who leads this effort? I, I don't know. Maybe uh, we'll be surprised. Maybe it'll be someone like uh, China or Russia. But uh, it seems like the United States, for now anyway, mm. is pulling away. Mr. Owen? Uh, Persia, now Iran, has always been a regional power, and it has ambitions to be um, a world power. Um, this has almost nothing to do with the Islamic Revolution. It happened under the Shah when Iran was Israel's de facto ally, and it was the custodian of the Persian Gulf for the uh, United States. Now, what Obama is obviously trying to do is prepare the ground for the Khamenei succession. Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, is uh, in its last year's, his last According to Iran. rumors, first well, stage yes, of cancer, according so According to so actuary forth. tables, uh, <laughs> he could not live um, much longer, perhaps uh, a few years uh, mm -hmm. from now. If not, we wish him uh, good health uh, and, um, and uh, perhaps some conversion to Judaism. Mm. Uh, if that is also uh, possible. But if Obama wants the next generation of Iranian leaders to be moderate, he is now investing in it. If uh, he fails in his uh, bet, we will see a resurgent Iran, perhaps even better positioned to, uh, to attack. However, uh, Iran uh, will always decide according to its own mm. egocentric interests. Not what is good for the Muslims or for the Arabs, what is good for the Iran. One sentence, a uh, closing sentence from you, Mr. Lindy. Look, I mean, it's hard to be an optimist in this world that we're living in uh, and to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But perhaps um, if Israel could get together, as we've mentioned, mm. with um, a new alliance of modern Arab states, uh, that will be a great reality indeed. We're actually out of time, so thank you so very much, Mr. Lindy, for coming here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Owen, uh, for being here and enriching us with uh, this knowledge. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next week. You just watched Jerusalem Studio. If you were enriched by the program, please consider supporting Heaven TV 7 Jerusalem. Call us at 0600 10077 or send your donation using the bank account reference number on the screen. You can also donate via PayPal. Jerusalem Studio is made possible by your donation.